have a very good speaker, James Randi, world-renowned magician, psychic debunker, MacArthur Fellow, and he can talk about himself better than I can. Ladies and gentlemen, James Randi. Thank you, Josh. You're late. Did you bring a note? Well, it's okay. <laughs> Good morning, and I'm a, I am a suitably and similarly edified to see so many people with their eyes actually open. <laughs> it's astonishing, and their hearts presumably going at the same time. I um, I'm on some sort of a jet lag. I don't. I used to. It used to be much easier for me on jet lag. I could go to any distance spot in the world and. Waking up in the morning, I'd uh, announce to myself, this is breakfast, and I'd hear a little zzzz inside, it would reset, you know. At, uh, at my advanced age, at 78, shortly to be, oh, in a couple of days to be 79, as a matter of fact, I uh, don't find the zzzz happens quite as fast, so I, I congratulate you all for rising so early. Um, as the uh, gentleman told you, my name is James Randy. I was known professionally as the amazing Randy of all things. And uh, it was better than being the great Randy. I, I'm great too, but uh, <laughs> I didn't want to advertise that, you know. Uh, so I, I, I consider myself to be mildly astonishing at this point. Uh, <laughs> or perhaps surprising, I'm not too sure. I, uh, I thought uh, I just walked up these stairs here. I, I, I must tell you that I am just recovering from a double bypass with complications, and I don't recommend it at all. I would try <laughs> to avoid it if you possibly can, but I lost 26 pounds in doing that. And uh, a bit of fallout from that, by the way, is in the pants that are now uh, had four and a half inches taken in. When I go for my pockets, I do this. Oh, I have to move back. <laughs> uh, that's a little fallout from that uh, that I hadn't anticipated. So uh, having recovered, uh, being in the state of recovery that I am, walking up the stairs has a certain amount of importance to me because I'm able to manage it very well. Thank you. And uh, I've been going to the gym three days a week, and just recently I got a call from a gentleman who will be joining you people at Google, Ed Liu, the astronaut, who is now coming to be a Google person. And uh, you will enjoy Ed Liu. First of all, his name is very easy to write, E-D-L-U. You know, it doesn't take a long time or anything like that when you're writing invitations to, for him to come to parties. Uh, he and his, and his beautiful wife and adorable little child will be uh, here before too long, I'm sure, and uh, make his acquaintance. He is a, a most remarkable gentleman. He uh, called me a few months ago and uh, just wanted to inquire about the state of my recovery from this operating procedure, and uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I played a bit of a joke on him. You see, I had been in contact in one way or the other. We did the first card trick in space. <laughs> Literally, the first card trick in space. He uh, when I met him in Houston, uh, Texas, some years ago at the uh, Houston Space Flight Center, uh, he came up with an idea where we were sitting there imbibing coffee, and he said, why don't we do a trick from the ISS to the Earth? And I said, that's not a bad idea at all. Let's do it. And I said, all you have to do is just take along a deck of cards, a sealed deck of cards up into space, and I will have one back on Earth, and uh, NASA will connect us and the whole business. And uh, he was instructed to take his deck of cards and shuffle it up, as I did, back at home base in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and then put it behind his back and take one card out and turn it over in the pack and reinsert it into the pack. And he did that. Of course, he didn't know what the card was, and I said, I'm doing the same thing here now. And, okay. I said, now, I want you to look through your, your card deck until you, you find the one that's turned over. And, right on camera there. He's, of course, he's floating around like this while he's doing it. I couldn't manage that. I tried, but <laughs> fell off the table. Um, and one card, he turned around. He stuck it in the pack, and he said, it is seven of diamonds. Yes, seven of diamonds. And I said, ah, le voila. And I fanned out my deck, and there was a card turned over, and I pulled it out, and it was a seven of diamonds. A miracle of a semi-religious nature, obviously. <laughs> And, uh, well, thank you, you didn't see it, so you shouldn't be applauding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the point was, of course, that Ed had no idea how it was done, and NASA was bothering him for weeks afterwards, calling him, you know, uh, 
Uh, but, uh, Ed Lou, yes, uh, this is uh, so and so, some high official. Here. Uh, by the way, how did you do that card trick? Uh, <laughs> and he had no idea how it was done, of course. Uh, he was quite an innocent bystander, my victim. I you refer to them as my victims. And uh, he ca had called me anyway to see how well I was doing. And I said, Ed, I'm doing very well. I'm doing three days uh, a week at the gym. Now, as, as I was saying a moment ago, I was keeping track of what he was doing. And I saw him on the extra cycle all the time, whenever I, I uh, was able to, to pick up the, the NASA uh, broadcast and uh, transmission, I should say. And um, so I, I set him up for a bit of a joke. Uh, I said, I'm off to the gym and I'm doing the same thing that I see you doing on the ISS, and that is, I'm on an extra cycle. And uh, I figure at the gym, I have already bicycled all the way to Mexico City and back without leaving the gym, and I've rode my way halfway across the Atlantic, and I'm on my way back. And he said, well, he said, I got that all over you. And I said, why? I said, uh, he, he said to me, so I was traveling at 18,000 miles an hour when I did it. And I said, and I, this is the question, I knew the answer to it, you see, so I set him up for it. I said, well, think now, are you sure you were facing the right direction? <laughs> and I knew he wasn't, you see. He had his back to the way that the, the ISS was traveling. And he thought for a moment, and I heard, no, I guess not. I said, then you owe me all that mileage. <laughs> so that's, I, but I, I ask you to look forward to uh, the advent of Ed Lou on your uh, horizon here, you're going to enjoy this man. He's uh, a smart cookie, uh, man with a great sense of humor, obviously, because he managed to survive me. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy his, his presence uh, among you. Now, um, I was referred to in the introduction, erroneously, I must say, as a debunker. <clears throat> I don't accept that terminology. A debunker to me, would be someone who goes into an investigation announcing in advance, this is not so, and I'm going to prove it to be not so. I can't afford that. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I try to at least follow scientific protocols whenever I can manage to. No, I go into something as an investigator, not a debunker. If you announce your, your attitude, what you want to find or what you expect to find, in advance, that's not really the way a scientist should go about it. Now I know that in science, yes, that's usually the case. You, you have a conclusion that's in mind and you want to examine it to see if that conclusion is correct. Technically speaking, perfectly speaking, I would say, uh, ideally speaking, you should go into it saying, I just don't know, but I'll find out. Now, I've investigated the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, and a few things like that along the way, and at Santa Claus as well. Now, I'm 78, as I said, and 77 Christmas Eves, I sat by the chimney and waited. <laughs> so 100% of my evidence indicates to me that he's not going to be coming down the chimney next time. So this next December the 25th, I'm going to go to bed early. Now, I hate to admit that because I've given up the scientific pursuit of whether or not fat guys in red suits can get down chimneys. But uh, I think the answer is probably no. So there are some things that are pretty evident to us um, that we, we don't have to really look into. And uh, I, when I look into claims of telepathy and such, I have to say, probably not. Very, very probably not, because I don't know of any modus that could be used to transfer thoughts from one mind to the other. You know, the, the amount of energy generated and the signal generated is not great enough. I'm pretty sure of that. But I don't know. I better find out. When it comes to things like homeopathy, oh boy. Homeopathy. Let me give me my quick rundown on homeopathy. Now, the kind of thing that my foundation, the James Randi Educational Foundation, investigates, and offers a million dollars for evidence of, by the way, deposited with Goldman Sachs, and you can check it out, it's there and use, usable only for, the, <clears throat> pardon me, for that purpose. We offer this prize to anyone who can prove any paranormal, occult, or supernatural event of any kind under proper observing conditions. It's that last phrase that gets them. They <laughs> apparently can't do it under proper observing conditions. They'd like woo-woo conditions. So that's a <laughs> general term that I use to cover this, this field. We uh, offer this prize, and we have offered this prize now for, I guess, we're in our 12th year of offering the actual million dollars. Now, the fact that no one has collected it doesn't mean that these powers don't exist. 
It just means that nobody yet has collected it. So we're willing to be shown. Now, I, uh, I certainly won't live long enough to see any serious challenge uh, admitted, but one of these things, uh, this uh, such thing as uh, homeopathy, for example, would not seem to come under our venue. This not paranormal, supernatural. But if it worked, after I describe it to you, I think you'll agree with me, it certainly would be supernatural. How many, uh, by a show of hands, how many people might have a, an idea that they know something about homeopathy, they generally know what it is. Let's see hands. Uh, oh, I see. Well, well-informed audience. I like that. I wasn't warned of that in advance. Gee. <laughs> uh, homeopathy uh, originated with a man named Hahnemann, Samuel Hahnemann, who lived in Switzerland, where, I must add, most of the quackery today comes from. <laughs> Literally, it does. Oh, yes, and all kinds of magnets to put into your shoes and uh, 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 mysterious vibrations in in uh, wafers and whatnot. It, it's incredible how much comes out of Switzerland. Um, Hahnemann came up with the idea with, for homeopathy uh, and was very, very popular immediately because in his day, they were barely out of the, uh, the age of Paracelsus, and Paracelsus was very fond of giving people all kinds of esoteric things like kettlebell, which is a uh, derivative of mercury, and the uh, patients, the symptoms went away immediately, but so did the patient, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but they were very, very good-looking corpses in, the, uh, in the, uh, the funeral parlor, I'm sure, because uh, calomel has a way of clearing the complexion. So you died looking really good. <laughs> now, Paracelsus, uh, you know, that, uh, that was not really medicine as we know it today, uh, not at all, but Hahnemann came up with the idea of very small doses uh, of medicine would be just as effective and more effective than large doses. Now, this is what they do. And these are a few of the simple rules. I can't go into the whole thing or we'd be here for many weeks. Uh, the first rule of homeopathy is that you take one part of medication, X, whatever it is, okay? And you dissolve it. We're assuming that it's soluble in water uh, for, the, for the case that I'm going to suggest here. One part of it. Ten parts, or nine parts of water, pardon me. Okay. That's a, that's a one solution, they call that. In other words, ten to the power one, okay? You take, oh, pardon me, you have to success it. I forgot to tell you about that. You have to shake it in three dimensions ten times. Ten is the magic word in homeopathy. Sounds woo-woo, doesn't it? And it is. <laughs> but it's sold all over the world for fortunes at ten times this way, ten times this way, and ten times this way. That's success now. That's a one solution. Then you take one part of that solution and you put it in nine parts of water. That becomes, after you success it at first, you can the whole thing, it now becomes a two solution. One part in 100, you see. They keep on going, doing this, shaking and shaking and shaking, and they have the machines to do it. They actually have, in the factory, they have the machines that do this. And tung, tung, ten times this way, and it, ten times this way, and it's official then. And um, they continue it on for at least... 20 of these procedures, at least 20 of these procedures, and they prefer 30 because that's what it really gets active, you see? Now, wait a minute. <coughs> what about this guy, what was his name? Avogadro, <laughs> very, very inconvenient gentleman who decided that, uh, please don't laugh at science. <laughs> at 10 to the 23rd, or my, 10 to the minus 23, I should say, uh, you reach Avogadro's limit, which says, in case you've forgotten from high school, that you have the probability of there being one molecule or atom of the original substance present in the solution. By the time you get to 10 to the 24th, which is still well under the 10 to the 30th that they really love, um, you have one chance in 10 of there being one molecule or atom of the substance still in place. Okay. They go all the way up. Are you all seated? Oh, you folks at the back, hold on. Okay? They go up to the power of 10 to the minus 1,500. That's dilute. <laughs> you can't get diluter than that, if that's a good word. Now, my good friend Martin Gardner, I'm sure you know of Martin Gardner, he's 94 going on 95 and is as smart today as he was when he was a teenager. And that's pretty damn smart. I called Martin and I said, I need some sort of a little metaphor for lay audiences. Not that you're a lay audience, of course. 
uh, to try to explain this sort of thing. And he, he worked something out for me. And he said, yes, uh, if you uh, went to the dilution of uh, 1,500, you would uh, have enough. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I talked to him about the uh, duck liver compound. There's a very popular, it's sold at all drugstores here all over the, the country and all over the world. As a matter of fact, a cure for flu symptoms. And it's made from duck liver. Well, it's easy on the ducks. <laughs> because the medicine prepared from one duck liver would be enough to fill a sphere the size of the solar system with the sun at the center and the orbit of Pluto at the outside on all sides. Now, that's an awful lot of water. Where you're going to get it and where you're going to stir it or how you're going to shake it, I don't know, but I'll leave the problems to them. They're the homeopaths and they should be able to handle this sort of thing. <laughs> Homeopathy is the silliest damn idea. It's just ridiculous. It's incredible that anyone, A, could come up with the idea, and more seriously, how anybody could believe it. But it is sold all over the world. And the third rule of homeopathy. The more dilute the medicine is, the stronger it is. Duh. That's a word I use frequently. Duh. Thank you, Homer Simpson. The stronger it is, really. Well, we had a case of, uh, of uh, a fellow died in Fort Lauderdale. I just heard about it a couple of weeks ago there. He died of an overdose, forgot to take his medicine. <laughs> okay, right, all right, okay, all right. All right. You're, you're talking about a man's death now. He perished. It was a terrible thing to see. Terrible thing to see. So, folks, that's just one thing that we have to consider at the James Randi Educational Foundation in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, www.randy.org. Look it up. We have to consider that uh, homeopathy, from that description, would have to be paranormal or supernatural uh, if it worked at all. Now, does it work at all? Well, we've done comprehensive tests of it just uh, a couple of years ago on BBC for the, the uh, is it the Royal Academy or the Royal Institution? I, I've forgotten, in, uh, in Britain. Any UKers out there? Yeah. What is it? Royal Society. Royal Society, I think, probably. Yes, okay, yes, I'm sorry. Pardon my ignorance. It's the effects of the operation, folks. <laughs> um, I, uh, I did a test. Uh, I had them do the test. Oh, by the way, uh, yes, when they did the test, I sent them a protocol that I suggested for it, and the homeopaths accepted it, because, and I, I designed it because it's in line with what homeopaths do, or think they do. And... Uh, I said to them, I said, I don't want to know when the test takes place, however. I only want to know well after the test has been done and the figures have all been recorded and whatnot. And they said, why? I said, because the homeopaths, as well as many other people who, uh, who want to be tested by our foundation, they say that I shouldn't know about it because if I know about it, then I can put out negative vibrations. Duh, again. Negative vibrations that will inhibit the experiment, you see. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't know when it was being done. And when they called me and said it was done, I said, ah, quel surprise, you know. I mean, I really didn't know. And what were the results? Oh, we can't tell you, Mr. Randy, at your request. I said, that's true. So we had the statistician there prepare all the information, error bars, the whole business, but not actually enter the data to it until I arrived in the UK. And I sat in front of cameras, the Royal Society, and the, the, the president, I believe, of the Royal Society sitting there with me, and he said, are you ready, Mr. Randy? Now, I was suffering from laryngitis. I had <clears throat> developed it on the plane somehow. And uh, they got several camera shots of me going <clears throat> like this, looking worried. <laughs> and the BBC actually edited that in. I wasn't the least bit worried, friends. I had a million dollars riding on it from my foundation, but not the least bit worried. And uh, so they edited that in. So I have to chide the BBC for that. So next time you see a BBC or give them a little shot. <laughs> on my behalf. And uh, so they pressed the buttons on the computer and up it came. Error bars like this. Data. Very nicely in the middle of it. Thank you. Hallelujah. And uh, not only did we not have to give up the million dollars, but then we had to listen to the homeopaths saying, oh, those homeopaths didn't know what they were doing. Well, we had chosen the, the top people. Riley was one of them who is the royal homeopath. The royal family in England depends on homeopathy, by the way. Have you seen the state of the House of Windsor lately? <laughs> yes, aside from the fire, I mean, they haven't been doing very well, have they? 
but they've depended on homeopathy ever since it started in Switzerland way back. Now, again, this is one of the subjects that we had to make an exception for to handle it because I thought it was important. But there are all kinds of other subjects. Now, who applies for our million dollar prize? Hundreds of people over the years. 85% of them are dowsers, diviners. People with pendulums or with parallel coat hanger wires uh, or with a fork stick. That's the original, that's the honored way to do it, you see. Now, uh, we in Italy, <laughs> we did a, a test of dowsing. Uh, oh, this is many years ago now. This is before the million dollar prize uh, was in existence. And there's one poor gentleman there. Oh, it hurts me to even think about this. He had this fork stick like this. Now, what you do is you hold it like this, you see, and you tense it. Oh, it's got to go down or up. No two ways about it. It's a green stick, you see, very flexible. So to keep it steady, you have to do this kind of thing. You have to really work, and, you're supposed, and it sits there, and it trembles up and down, and they look at this as, oh, that's the force. Yes, it's this force. That's what's <laughs> happening. It wants to go up or down, and you're preventing it from going up and down. You're keeping it in balance. And this poor chap was walking along, and suddenly it flipped downwards. Think about that. <laughs> Vroom! Ha! <laughs> that was quite a surprise. So he got it straightened out again, and he walked rather funny after that. But then it flipped upwards, hit him between the eyes, and really broke his glasses into the frames. And he, he had to walk around with the glasses more like this on his face. The poor chap. I mean, he was not only wounded, almost mortally, but blinded at the same time. Um, he didn't find the water underground that we had uh, planted. We had uh, set pipes outside there under the ground and we dug the, the pits and we put the pipes in. Then we had a set of valves that would send it through one of them at random, one of the paths that were under the ground there. And uh, they, they failed miserably on that, but the dowsers always fail. And why do dowsers believe that they can really do this? Because of a thing known as the idiomotor reaction. It doesn't mean you're an idiot if you have it. Uh, what it means is that you are actually moving the dowsing stick yourself and you're not aware of it. You're actually, because as it's always with a system in poor equilibrium, a pendulum, for example, very hard to keep that from swinging, very, very hard. And you'll actually see people, we fasten little uh, sequins to the back of their hands and reflected lasers off them so that you see them jumping all over the ceiling. They're supposed to be sitting perfectly still like this with the, with the, dowsing, with the uh, pendulum in their hand. And you see the, the, that it's actually doing this kind of thing. They're actually moving their hand and they're unaware of it. Now that may be hard for you to believe that they're unaware of the fact that they're actually moving the pendulum or the stick or the coat hanger wires. Oh, with the coat hanger wires, that's an interesting thing about dowsing too. The school of dowsing. They love to use these coat hanger wires that are bent like this and you hold them, you try to hold them parallel, you see, and you walk along and if there's water flowing underground, of course. Well, what will they do? Will they cross or will they diverge? Well, half of the dowsers say that they should diverge when there's water underground. The other half say that they cross. So they disagree fundamentally. But there's also another division among the dowsers. They say you must never wear insulating footwear. The others say you must always wear <laughs> insulating footwear. So there's disagreement among the ranks here, you see. But the basic fact is that none of them can douse because we have, we have established the fact over the years that no dowser can find the same spot twice, and no two dowsers can same, find the same spot once. <laughs> now, that's, that's rather damning, I would say, but these people believe in it because the idiomotor reaction is very strong. I can't describe to you how strong it is unless you've experienced it yourself. I'll give you an example. In Australia, from my good friend Dick Smith there, who is uh, always willing to sponsor such a set of experiments, we sent a bunch of dowsers out into the into the field and uh, we tested them thoroughly and they got exactly, again, error bars and results all in here. We, we got exactly what we would expect by chance alone. Well, uh, Dick Smith after that uh, assembled the 11 dowsers who had come from all over Australia in order to be tested. And he asked them a, a basic question. How many of you still believe that you have the power to douse? And they all shut up their heads because there is no convincing disconvincing, I should say, the true believer. No matter what evidence is presented, they can fail any number of times consistently and they still believe they've got the power, no matter what. So all the hands shot up and then one fellow drew his hand down like this and Dick jumped on him right away and said, 
You don't believe you got the power? He said, well, I didn't say that. No, I, I have doubts about it. Now I have to think about this uh, a little bit more, I think. And Dick turned to me and he said, we got one out of 11. We've never gotten a high score like that. <laughs> I said, no, no, we haven't gotten them yet. Give them four or five days. I was wrong. It only took him two hours. He called from out on the road after he had left, and he said he figured out it was the walkie-talkies we were using to keep in communication. This set up radio frequency, he said. He described it in detail. Radio frequency, right. And that's what interfered with the dowsing powers. Oh, drat, we failed again. Now, they, the reporter that was there covering this for some scientific magazine, I, I've forgotten what it was now, um, he said, but why do they believe? And I told him, it's the idiomotor effect. And then I thought, wow. You know, you get a little ding, a little light bulb or whatever. Now it's an incandescent one. Uh, you had a fluorescent one, so it saves power, as you know. And uh, I, I got this great idea, and I stuck to a filing cabinet was a big speaker magnet, you know, from the interior of a, of a regular cone speaker. Very, very strong. You have to slide it to the edge of the filing cabinet and pull that off. Very, very strong field. And I laid it face up on the desk, and I gave him one of the dowsing rods, this coat hanger wire like this, and I said, now, take it, just pass it over the top of the magnet. He did, and bang, the magnet pulled it down. I said, okay, now, you know that at that distance it'll pull it down. I pulled it off, and I said, here, take it and hold it sufficiently high up above here so you'll only feel the effect. I said, wait, now rearranged a few things here and I said and it will work through a piece of cardboard too by the way and I had a piece of cardboard there and I laid that over top of the magnet and I said that doesn't inhibit it at all of course as you probably know and uh, I said now raise just pass the dowsing rod back and forth uh, until you just feel it as it passes over the magnet and he did this and he said oh yes you can I said you can feel it tug he said oh yes it very definitely it tugs right at this position here moved it back and forth, and I said, okay, now move it away, and I just flicked the cardboard off. There was no magnet there. I, surreptitiously being a conjurer, you see, I had <laughs> scooted it over to the far side of the desk. And he looked, and he passed the rod back again. This time, he didn't feel the, the pulling power. That's the idiomotor effect. It's really a positive psychological effect. You believe that you feel something like that, when it's not there. And that's why the dowsers are so convinced that they have the power to douse. Now, I, I think maybe it's time to uh, throw it open to questions and perhaps answers. Uh, I may have suggested a few things, and maybe you'd have questions about the status of the million dollar uh, challenge or how we would pay it up and whatnot. I will add uh, in advance, uh, there are two uh, stages to testing for the million dollars. First of all, you have to make application and uh, fill out uh, your description of what you can do under what circumstances with what accuracy. Three simple things that they can't seem to manage for some reason or other. Get the statement notarized and they send it in. And then there are two stages, the preliminary stage and the, the formal stage of the test. No one has ever passed the preliminary stage. In all the years that this prize has been out there, no one has ever if, well, you can't come close to it, you see, because the rules are laid out in such a way. This is a successful result. This is not a successful result. And there's no arguing and no judging, no evaluating or assigning value to it. No, it, you either do it, it's like, I can fly by flapping my arm. Step over to the window. <laughs> you lose. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it, it's decisive. You don't have to make a decision on it. And they always say, oh, James Randi is the one who makes the decision. No, there's no decision to be made. And in most cases, I have nothing to do with the testing procedure whatsoever. We get, oh, some of you folks here might be available for that purpose. If, uh, <laughs> if someone in San Jose, for example, decides they want to take the million dollar prize, we could send them around here to be tested. Oh boy, that would be fun, yes. Uh, so we, we're looking for volunteers all the time, people who are uh, capable of, uh, of doing such a simple test. Uh, usually these are very simple tests because they're very simple folks. What can I say? Uh, so I'll, I'll say that uh, in preparation for what might be questions and uh, hopefully will be answers. And by the way, holding your hand up is not like this. This is holding your hand up, okay? Just in case you weren't aware of that. Let's see hands. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, wait till I get the mic over, please. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I was wondering what your opinion was on the Global Consciousness Project. Well, this is not something that... Uh, oh, you mean the global consciousness, you said? 
yes. The, the okay. global conscious at yes, Princeton? Yes, right. yes. Yes, uh, uh, who, uh, pardon my memory lapse here, but who, uh, who are the people in behind that? You don't know? I, well, I don't know either, so there you go. Um, I can't think. I, I am having memory lapses, folks. I, I apologize for that. Uh, long anesthetics over a period of 14 months, and uh, I am having memory lapses. The global consciousness, anyway, I can describe that to you. This is an idea that there's some sort of a, of a, of a mother load of uh, thoughts or something out there that everybody is in connection with everybody. All brains are in contact with, with uh, lichens and uh, various forms of other moss and other individuals and Republicans, you know, people like that, <laughs> and, um, that uh, there is some sort of communication or connection, uh, a global network uh, uh, all over the world. And uh, they, they look at, uh, what they do is they, uh, they look for anomalies in nature and they try to make them correspond or uh, correlate to such things as 9-11, for example. Oh, they, they find relationships. Of course, they don't look for something for uh, 8-11 or... Uh, uh, even 9-10, they don't look for it. They only look for it at 9-11 because something really happened there, you see, that uh, was rather important socially uh, and uh, economically and emotionally. Uh, but the global consciousness thing, they, they are data searching. They are literally data searching. They are looking for something that they believe should be there after the event. And uh, you can't do that. You, you should be able to announce that certain things when there are certain peaks that, that you're looking for, that they exist, you don't have to go and look for an event to match up to it. Because somebody's birthday might be much more important uh, than some other kind of, the Titanic say, sinking or something like that. Although I don't think global consciousness was around when the Titanic was sailing the oceans. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, no, that's it's such a general claim. It is such a general claim, and it does not stand examination when you see the way uh, they consider the data, though it's very popular among the woo-woo artists out there, and there are many, many of them, perhaps even in the same room, I'm not sure, <laughs> but you'll all be tested shortly, so uh, bear that in mind. Other questions that we could, uh, yes, back there. Have you thought of uh, charging an ent or, uh, application fee so that you, then you can offer a $2 million prize soon? <laughs> well, uh, what we've done is we've changed the... Um, the rules of application for the prize. Now, if we charge any kind of a fee, they say, ah, it's a money-making scheme, you see. So, and, and we're a 501c3, after all, so we have to be careful in that respect. And, of course, I wouldn't do that ethically anyway. But we have changed the rules just recently. As of April the 1st, which we thought was a good day to change them, <laughs> we were founded on April the 1st, as a matter of fact. And I wish I'd been born on April the 1st. I tried hard, but you know, wasn't able to manage it. <laughs> Uh, we changed the rules. Now people, uh, all the applicants have to have, A, a media presence. That means they have to have been written up or featured on a, on a TV show and not, say, Oprah or something important like that. Uh, uh, but they have to, and it can't be the local chiropractor news or something like that, but it has to be something uh, reasonably uh, recognizable uh, as a media presence and they have to have at least one academic to support them. Now that latter one will be very easy to do because we have academic, oh look at Brian Josephson, Nobel laureate, uh, winner in, in the UK in Cambridge. Uh, oh, he, he said to us some time ago to Bob Park, uh, my good friend Bob Park with the American Physical Society, uh, he wrote them and he said, I'm sure the APS uh, won't bother to look into Ben Beniste's claims, uh, that's a scientist uh, recently deceased unfortunately in France, who was plugging, plugging up the uh, whole homeopathy picture. And he said, I'm sure you won't use uh, Ben Benice's method to test homeopathy. So Bob called me and said, what do you suggest we do? I said, accept, accept it. I'll throw my million dollars in too. And so he not only did that, but he said the American Physical Society, the APS, will cover all expenses of this, which would have come to about ten to $15,000, and they were willing to, to fund that. Never heard from Josephson from this moment on. Now, there's a Nobel laureate in physics who, you know, physics is the queen of sciences, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Um, uh, some discussion on that matter, too, I'm told. Uh, Josephson hasn't responded to us since that time. Not a word, not a word out of him. And uh, Ben Beniste has uh, conveniently uh, perished, so uh, we, we don't get much reaction to that anymore. But uh, the fact is that scientists are not immune to this kind of thinking, not at all. May not be a surprise to many people in this room, but it is true. You would think that people uh, who are trained in science and in logic and in rationality would have a better 
uh, picture of how the real world works and that they wouldn't accept some of these woo-woo things, but they do. Uh, David Bohm at one point fell for it as well and believed that Uri Geller could actually bend spoons with his mind. Ooh. Now, there's a useful talent, by the way. It's moved humanity forward enormously, as we know, <laughs> in the last 35 years since it was invented. Uh, other questions? We pass that along. Yes, sir. Have you ever tried the I'm feeling lucky button? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a good friend of mine, Richard Wiseman in the, in the UK, a parapsychologist who has never had a positive experiment in his life and is proud of it. No, he's, he's our good friend and he knows how to do science. He set up kiosks all over the UK uh, with multiple choice questions on there. I, I, you had to guess... Hey, I think it was just a heads or tails thing as to what would happen on the screen and such. And he found out an astonishing fact, ladies and gentlemen. Laws of statistics still work. <laughs> Distribution, permutations, combinations still works, folks. So in case you were wondering whether those laws were giving up or whatever due to the present administration with faith-based uh, reasoning, of course. <laughs> um, you know, apparently um, that is, is not the case. And Wiseman had a huge database. I've forgotten what it was now, but a huge database uh, uh, automatically recorded by all these machines, these kiosks. All, he got a good, some good funding for it, too, from some agency out there. And uh, so uh, it, the, the law of probability, uh, laws of probability still work. And, and statistics and all that kind of thing, so you can be perfectly safe. Uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, two re related questions. Uh, first, what's the most interesting claim you've ever received? And second, has anybody claimed that they could fly or levitate? I mean, I, I, to, to levitate? Uh, uh, levitation. Yeah. Ah, well, I've uh, have, we have had a lot of claims of levitation. Yes, uh, but uh, they usually don't go beyond the application point. You see, most of the applications are good. Oh, a good, I'd say 75, maybe 80 percent of the application never go beyond the stage of sending in the form, and then we can't contact them. One a PhD here in California, as a matter of fact, not far from here, as a matter of fact, uh, it, it, was t it actually teaches remote viewing. That's casting your mind off to Jupiter or to Afghanistan or something. They never want to cast it to Fort Lauderdale, where the weather is much nicer, uh, because I have a cupboard there, a locker, pardon me, with uh, something close at it. Uh, every two weeks, we change the object that's in there. All they have to do is do the remote viewing in there and tell us what it is, and you win the prize. But um, the, this, uh, where was I? <laughs> yes, uh, the, the levit oh, levitation, the levitation thing. We, we get claims for this constantly. But they can never go beyond that certain point of just sending in the, the form because they can't decide how they're going to do it. You see, I want you to float. Oh, well, now you're putting me to the test. Yes, that's the idea. <laughs> a million dollars in here, you see. And what was the first part of your question? I'm sorry. The most interesting claim. The most uh, exciting claim? Oh, well, the most interesting claim. They're all mildly interesting and uh, some a little more interesting than others. Uh, well, we've, we've had claims... Um, most of the claims are on healing uh, that, we, that we get that are interesting because they can cure one specific thing, usually. I can cure menopause or something like this, and we get this frequently. Oh, yes. And, oh, there, there are other things that maybe I can't get into some of the details of them, but uh, uh, one lady was sure that she could arouse a gentleman's interest in certain directions uh, by remote control. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we decided that maybe that was a little too frivolous for us and we, we didn't get into it, but I really wanted to try it, you know? <laughs> a, a challenge, a challenge, I, I, to say the least. <laughs> so, but they are they're such, of such a, a wide spectrum, uh, but again, most of them, a uh, uh, good 85% of them are dousing uh, in one way or another. Uh, whether it's finding ore or finding lost children. Oh, uh, by the way, we've also, um, uh, not part of the challenge, but I have investigated such things as the quadro rod, which you may not have heard of, but your government spent an awful lot of money on quadro rods. These are dowsing rods. They look like, uh, like a TV remote control with, a, with an antenna, a collapsible antenna that comes out the side of it, you see, and it waggles around. It's the same old thing. It's just like the, the coat hanger wire, but they don't seem to know that. And we... Um, it was actually tested the Department of, uh, no, the uh, Department of Defense? No, not Department of Defense. Uh, Department of Energy, DOE. Uh, they did a test one, and they took it apart. And they found out that the working part in it was a piece of epoxy, hardened epoxy, with, I hope you're ready for this, 
dead ants in it. <laughs> now, how this is supposed to power the thing, I have no notion whatsoever. Uh, your ideas are as good as mine, and my, mine are absolutely zero. But uh, that device was sold to the government, and it was sold to customs agents and to um, members of uh, Homeland Security uh, all over the country at $75,000 a shot. And it didn't work. Hey, really? It didn't work? No, it didn't work. And, but they spent the money on it. They spent the money on it, and uh, I was uh, instrumental with the uh, Department of Energy in helping them design simple tests for it because I knew what the idiomotor reaction was, and uh, they had to be done double-blinded, of course. But uh, no, they, uh, these are among some of the more interesting ones, but we have filing cabinets just full of the... Uh, uh, on my website someplace, I have a picture of, of our associate Kramer sitting in among a whole bunch of filing folders, and believe me, and all with little red stickers on them, that means they've been tested and, you know, no good. Uh, they could reapply after a year, by the way. Only one person has ever reapplied, and then didn't go through it after all. So, uh, you know, very disappointing. We're trying to find uh, Nobel Prizes all over the place, and we apparently can't award them. Uh, other questions? Uh, right down here. Yes, sir. Um, it's a pleasure uh, listening to you today. Uh, I've been following your work for quite a few years, as I'm sure many others have. So I want to know, what's your position on acupuncture? Acupuncture, I was in, a, I've been in Beijing several times over the past few years, um, but about the third last visit, I guess, I got a chance to go to an acupuncture uh, uh, center there. I've forgotten the name of the organization within Beijing, but uh, the, uh, the, the people who... Um, uh, sponsored us and uh, served us very well there in Beijing. I spoke at several uh, uh, conferences in Beijing as well over the years, and I've always been well received. In fact, my books are all on sale uh, in Beijing. I got $120 for the rights to my books. Uh, well, that was just to pay the lawyers, uh, my, my lawyer, to make sure that I was being protected in some way or another. But I wanted the books to be in. Uh, in circulation, of course, and I think that China certainly can use it because that's a, there's a lot of woo-woo going on in China. Though my good friend Simonan over there is very active. He's sort of the James Randi of, of China and is doing a wonderful job to try to, uh, going around from center to center to, uh, to uh, teach people uh, in small towns particularly not to go for the woo-woo if they can possibly avoid it. But um, in any case, I went to this acupuncture clinic and I spoke to two gentlemen there, spoke perfect English, and... Um, they, one of them had been educated at MIT, as a matter of fact. And uh, they explained to me, they said, we have such huge medical problems here in China, and so we, what we have to do is we have to, uh, as any civilized country does, of course, uh, we have to sort people out uh, who are just working on imaginary ailments and would like some personal attention, some TLC. And so we bring them into the acupuncture clinic, and we give them moxibustion, uh, which is acupuncture with little bits of incense burning on the end of them. The heat transfers down the wire, you see. Right. And um, we, we bring them consolation. We bring them some satisfaction. And they feel better. They feel better, and they feel that they've gotten some attention from the government. Uh, but we make sure that these aren't people who require antibiotics or surgery or anything like that. Otherwise, we'll take care of them. And uh, now this is a confession from the two guys in charge. They're the two senior officers that they knew that acupuncture didn't really work except on a suggestive basis. And uh, I, I, I guess I'll have to take the word of the experts on this. And these people would appear to me to be the experts because they deal with it every day. And there were crowds of people lined up outside to come in and have needles stuck into them. And uh, in the right places, of course. Uh, I don't know whether you know, acupuncture is very interesting in that uh, it's typical sort of numerology, astrology, everything combined. There are 365 uh, acupuncture points around the body, each one, uh, uh, each one named for a specific day and named for a specific disease. So if you go in there and you have a specific ailment, if they use that acupuncture point, it's much more efficacious uh, than if they used uh, next Thursdays, for example. It, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be uh, applicable at all. Uh, so it's, it's mysticism. It really is mysticism. But it is an attempt, and we have to respect this. This is an attempt by early people of that country, and in India, and, and Burma, and all over the world, as a matter of fact, to try to solve how to heal people and how to solve life's mysteries. Because uh, religion, after all, is at a, first, a very first attempt at that, I believe, uh, to try to solve how things work. Hey, something hit me on the back of the head. There's no one around. 
that must have been, uh, oh, I'm near a mountain. Maybe a stone came out. No, that's probably the mountain god threw a stone at me. Or water came out of the air. Oh, that must be the rain god kind of thing. Because water's in the river. It doesn't normally come out of the air. It must be the rain god. This is a, a way to try to explain the universe. Uh, and it's an early attempt, and it's a primitive attempt, but it eventually, well, alchemy becomes chemistry eventually. And uh, witchcraft becomes medicine, when you come right down to it. And uh, these are, uh, both witchcraft and medicine are largely undeveloped. But, uh, you know, medicine is one of those things that um, is and can seem to be magical to the layman. And that's why quackery is so very popular these days. Uh, four time shoes, for example that you could buy up until, oh, I think about five or six years ago, you could buy Magnaforce shoes. Magnaforce shoes had at the toe, at the uh, insole, and at the heel, neodymium magnets, but wait a minute, the best part is they were unipole magnets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that's Nobel Prize right there. <laughs> I'm sure of it. A unipole magnet? Florsheim Shoes, uh, the, the last remaining man with the name Florsheim, sold the company. This is some years ago. Now, he sold the company, and it immediately fell into the hands of uh, marketers, and they announced right away that for $50 extra, your shoes could now be Magnaforce. Now, there was one very good thing about Magnaforce Shoes. If you ever needed a paperclip... <laughs> another one? Right here. And razor blades and a few other things, so you've got to be careful. Neodymium magnets embedded in the solar shell. Why? Because it helped your circulation. You see, there's <laughs> iron in blood. Da! In the form of hemoglobin, which isn't picked up by a magnet very readily, I don't think. Try it on your blood next time you cut your finger. Try a magnet and see if it picks it up. I don't think it's going to work very well. But the point is that they can get away with this kind of advertising because there's iron in blood and blood circulation is needed. You put these in your feet, and what that does is, now this is their reasoning, uh, their reasoning in quotes, uh, it draws the blood down into your feet because the heart is gonna pull it right back up again, you see, but it sometimes doesn't get all the way down to your feet. Duh. Now, why was this uh, accepted uh, in, the, in the general public? Well, they handed out leaflets. I've got a copy of them at home. They don't do it anymore because the Florsheim guy bought the company back again, thank goodness. And I'm very happy that he did. And he canceled Magnaforce shoes. You don't see them anymore, though you may still pick up paper clips on your shoes occasionally. So, um, Gary Null, you may know that name. PBS features him all the time in fundraising, as, along with Deepak Chopra and a few other, and uh, Wayne Dyer and a few other people like this. These are the, the, the quacks of philosophy and medicine and physics and the whole business. And uh, Gary Null, PhD, it cost him $40 for that PhD from a mail order house. <laughs> and plus postage, you have to pay postage as well. Uh, so I, I think that's an easy way to get a PhD and I think I'll get three or four of them uh, once I get some spare change. Uh, Gary Null is featured on PBS all the time and he made a statement in the Florsheim leaflet about Magnaforce shoes. He says, the magnets in the shoes interact with the natural magnetic fields of the earth, okay? in such a way that they neutralize one another and uh, when you're in motion, they, they add to one another. And so I, I've forgotten the term that he used. They, uh, I, I've forgotten, they, he used some sort of, they, they add up anyway, and they force the, the blood uh, to move around in your body. And he said, by the way, the magnetic poles of the earth are the only thing that keeps us from spinning off into space. <laughs> My comment on my webpage was, if you're wearing manhole covers on each foot, perhaps. But that really slows down swimming and clog dancing. And tap dancing is right out of the question altogether. Now, this was actually printed by this man, Gary Null, who apparently has a PhD. A $40 one, mind you, but nonetheless a PhD. He has it, has it on his wall. I've seen it. So it must be true. They wouldn't put it on the wall otherwise. Now... This is the kind of, of nonsense, pseudoscience, quackery, irrationality that we have to face up with every day. And that's why the James Randi Educational Foundation exists. And we do do something very crass by offering this million dollar prize. It's a huge carrot to wave around, right? But the fact that they won't pick it up. Now, sure, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Sylvia Brown, you know who Sylvia Brown is? Yeah, I'm Sylvia Broad, and I'm on the Larry King Show. Montel Williams just loves me, you know. 
Uh, she's, we call her the talons. She has nails about this long and such, which uh, she should have a slashed up face by now when she scratches her face at night. I don't know. But uh, Sylvia Brown, uh, she said that she would take us up on the, uh, the Million Dollar Challenge on the Larry King Show, which is broadcast internationally, as I'm sure you know, Sienna all over the world. And she said, yes, she'll take the challenge. Well, that was, what, eight and a half years ago? If you go to my webpage, there's a picture of Sylvia Brown there. You click on it, and you'll hear her latest comments on it. It's cricket sounds, by the way, because she hasn't made any comments on it. She said at first she didn't know how to contact me. She talks to dead people, guys. <laughs> she talks to the dead regularly, and she doesn't know how to contact me. I'm in the phone book, Sylvia. So finally, I sent her a registered letter, and she signed for it. It wasn't on my letterhead, so she signed for it. She wouldn't have otherwise, I'm sure. She signed for it, and it said, had in there uh, my name and address, my, my social security number, blood type, the whole thing, everything she needs. Uh, my sister in Canada and my brother in Canada I, I gave them as subsidiary, in case I'm visiting them. You see, she wouldn't want to miss out on contacting me. And I gave her everything, email address, the whole business. And she still hasn't reached me, but she's got an excuse now as to why she doesn't reach me. I'm not a godly person. <laughs> oh, that'll do it. But wait a minute. Wouldn't she want to take my million dollars then? Wouldn't she want to take the million dollars? Not my million dollars. It belongs to the foundation, which is a 501c3. I don't have a million dollars, but it's there and it's available. Wouldn't she want to take that just to make me look like some sort of a fool? Oh, Uri Geller, the spoon bender, he won't take the prize either. He says, A, first of all, he doesn't need it, which I believe. The other thing is, he doesn't like me. But that would be a good reason to make me look like some kind of an idiot, don't you think? And it would only take 30 minutes, Mr. Geller. Hello, are you there? Mr. Geller, I don't hear any answer, do you? And isn't there a lineup outside here right now from people trying to win the million dollars? Wouldn't there be at the foundation when I arrive in the morning? Wouldn't you think there'd be a long lineup down the street of people championing to get it and get it moving in front of one another in case the million dollars is won by the guy in front of you? But it doesn't happen that way. We've thrown down the challenge. We've said a billion dollars if you can prove that what you do is genuine. That's all. And I don't make the rules. And I don't conduct the test. We have independent people do those things. Where are these people? I have a question down here or where? Uh, um, where actually, we... I've got one. Um, okay. How did you get started in all the debunking? What, what caused you to uh, devote a fair part of your life to this? Well, I was born at a very early age in a log cabin I helped my dad build. And uh, <laughs> my parents were very poor and couldn't have ch kids, so the people next door had me, which is very convenient. Uh, oh, no, no, you mean the real story. Yeah. But, as a magician, as a professional magician traveling the world and uh, uh, ranking, I, I would say, tolerably well in the, uh, in the, um, the ranks of, of magicians, the Society of American Magicians, the International Brotherhood of Magicians, the Magic Circle in London, England, and a few other prestigious organizations like that. I travel all over the world and I learn something along the way that people are being uh, fooled by the, exactly the same methods that I would use on stage or in a nightclub, cabaret, whatever, or on television. Exactly the same methods are being used by people like uh, John Edward and uh, Sylvia Brown and the, and the rest of them, and Uri Geller uh, doing just common tricks. Uh, people are being fooled by these, by the, the, the charlatans out there who are trying to tell people that what they're doing is the real thing. Uh, no magician, David Copperfield, Penn and Teller, who I introduced to one another years ago, by the way, I'm guilty of that, uh, for the existence of Penn and Teller. Um, these people would never try to tell you that what they're doing is the real thing. Do you think David Copperfield actually asked you to believe that he cuts a girl in half with a buzzsaw? You know? And her mother comes backstage, where's my daughter? She's in Detroit and she's in Chicago. <laughs> you know, that'd be a difficult answer to have to give to mom, wouldn't it? No, we don't claim, we magicians, don't claim that we're doing genuine miracles at all. What we, the only thing we claim uh, at any time is that we are, we should say, we're conjurers. We approximate the effects that a real magician, someone who can subvert nature in some way or another, the laws of nature, subvert them, uh, would do. And we're entertainers. And we're very, very proud of being entertainers. And our art is a difficult one. It takes great subtlety and such, and, uh, and, and a lot of training, and uh, a, a lot of skill, a lot of skill constantly applied. Now, um, we're proud of that, as I say, and we're very, very angry at those people out there who try to fool people into thinking that they really have the powers. They don't. I can't prove that they don't, but then the onus of proof is on them. I don't say they're not magical. They say they are. Prove it.
get a million dollars. Question. Last question, I think. Okay. So there are lots of things in uh, recent physics, like quantum mechanics, that I think people don't really understand, like uh, the einstein podolsky rosen effect. I'm no quantum mechanic mechanicist or physicist, but um, like Einstein called that spooky action at a distance. But I think it's been confirmed at least a few times by modern physics. Like, does that count for the million dollars? <laughs> no, because, well, first of all, quantum physics has got me left way behind. I'm a good friend of Murray Gell-Mann's, by the way. He's a charming gentleman uh, who, if you ever get a chance to meet him, meet him. He's a character and a half. Love him. And they, he comes to our conferences quite frequently and speaks for us, and he's a great speaker, too. Uh, such things as charm and color on particles. That leaves me way behind. I really can't understand where these terms come from. But the problem of understanding uh, what quantum physics is all about is that the language, it borrows from the English language, meaning, meaning such as, as, uh, as, as, as charm and, and color and such, which don't mean charm and color. I'm a particle. How do you like that? Yeah. You know, and, I, and color, I don't know. I, I don't think that would be legal today. It would be looked upon as dis a discrimination of some kind if you had the different color of, di of different particles. But it doesn't mean that, of course. The language, the regular English language, is used uh, in different ways. And that's what leads to misunderstanding uh, of the misunderstanding of the public. Because uh, all the quacks out there, all the, the fakers, they all throw quantum physics into their descriptions. Go on to Google. Hey, there's a good place. Google knows everything, as you know, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, you go in there and you look up quantum and you look up uh, some other woo-woo subject in connection with it, and you will find descriptions with, that have the word quantum in them. And, and, and vibrations. They're very fond of the word vibrations, too. If you gave them a whole basket full of vibrations, they wouldn't know what to do with them. They don't know what they look like. They don't know what their characteristics are. They don't know what vibrations mean. But, oh, the vibrations are still there, as in homeopathy. You take the medicine out of the water, but the vibrations are still there. Oh, then I guess it's okay. Uh, it's, it's a misunderstanding. The whole business, the, the fact that the, the public is, is not well enough informed about these things, and I don't know how they can get informed at this stage, the, the way things are moving so ahead so much, in, uh, particularly in physics, but in science in general, uh, the fact that they're not well informed makes them perfect victims for the quack artists out there, and they're falling left and right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to. Pardon? You just said you weren't informed either, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I try to be, superficially. I'm a magician, remember? We, we pretend an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> but we do it for good purposes, I would say. I, uh, I really want to thank you for uh, having come here. This, this was sort of a throw in at the end of my. Uh, little uh, connection with Google uh, in, a, in an adjacent facility, and, uh, which was a very rewarding experience for me, too. I spent three days there and had a wonderful time, and Google extended this invitation to uh, uh, come and speak to you folks. It's been very edifying. I want to thank you for your patience with me, and if there are some of you who still believe in homeopathy out there, shame on you. <laughs> That's all I can say. Thank you very much, and thanks for the use of the hall.